Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's conference. At that time, to ask a question, you may press star 1 on your phone and record your name at the prompt. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Please stand by. The meeting will begin shortly. Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are on a listen-only mode until the question and answer session of today's call. Today's call is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I would now like to turn the call over to Catherine Hamilton. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you and good morning. I'm Catherine Hamilton with NASA's Office of Communications. Engineers recently replaced two seals on an interface for the liquid hydrogen fuel line between the Space Launch System rocket and the mobile launcher that was associated with a leak identified during a previous launch attempt. Teams are now preparing to test the seals and demonstrate updated loading procedures under the cryogenic or super cold uh, conditions that the systems will experience on launch day. Uh, Artemis 1 is a flight test to launch NASA's Space Launch System rocket to send an uncrewed Orion spacecraft around the moon and thoroughly test the spacecraft systems before missions with crew. Here to talk with us about the recent work, the upcoming tests and the path forward, are Tom Whitmire, Deputy Associate Administrator for Common Exploration Systems Development with NASA Headquarters, Jeremy Parsons, Deputy Manager for Exploration Ground Systems Program at NASA's Kennedy Space Center, John, Blevin, John Blevins, Chief Engineer for the Space Launch System Program at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center, and Mike Serafin, Artemis Mission Manager at NASA Headquarters. 
We'll have a few opening comments from each of our speakers, and then we will take questions. Reporters can enter star one on your phone to be entered into the question queue at any time. First, we will hear from Tom Whitmire. Okay, thank you, Catherine. Yeah, Mike and I are here with Catherine in DC. We're both, Mike and I, are getting ready to go down to Florida to get ready for a cryogenic demonstration test that's coming up Wednesday. We're pretty excited about that, and that's what we'd like to talk about today. Um, as noted, the uh, primary objective of the test is to look those two new seals that you've discussed and see how they perform. We've got some modified cryogenic loading procedures, which I'll talk a little bit about, and both Jeremy and John will talk some more about that. Uh, we're going to look at the um, core stage uh, and uh, ICPS load. We're going to also get into the start for the engines to see if we can get a good bleed. Uh, get them cooled down properly, and we'll also do the pre-press demonstration to uh, verify our valve timing. Uh, and then we're going to monitor uh, uh, the core stage uh, LH2 tank for, uh, for a period of time. The test is, uh, is, is objective-based, and we're not going to go into terminal count. Uh, and let me just talk about one more thing, and then I'll turn it over to Jeremy to get into more details. You know, we've been um, gone through a number of operations with this vehicle. We're learning more about this vehicle. It's a new machine for us. One of the things I think that we really have a better appreciation for now, which is what we will be demonstrating here on Wednesday, is what the, what we call kinder and gentler loading operations. And they talked about that the last time we got together. Um, for folks who aren't familiar with how this works, LOX is relatively dense. It's about the density of water, and we pump LOX. And so we have big pumps, and they actually LOX uh, is pumped into the vehicle when we do our loading operations. Hydrogen is very light. It's an extremely high-performing um, uh, fuel. In fact, you can't get to the moon in a single launch without hydrogen. That's, that's how uh, it performs. And uh, you don't actually pump hydrogen. You actually use pressure to move hydrogen. We have a pressure sphere sitting at the pad, and we uh, monitor and um, change that pressure uh, for the loading operations to uh, either increase or decrease the flow into the vehicle. We're going to be doing what we call the kindler, gentler kind of loading operations. Jeremy will talk about this a little bit more. We're going to lower that pressure a little bit at the beginning of the chill down procedures and then uh, up through the transition to fast fill. And we think that will really help with the pressure and temperature transitions that the system sees. That's just the one of many different things that we're incorporating in this demonstration to make this a, a robust operation to really make it uh, have the best uh, possibility for success. And we've looked at a whole bunch of different things, and we're incorporating a whole bunch of different things to, in this demonstration that people will get to see. Uh, the last thing I want to add is that we continue to work with the range in a proactive and a very collaborative way, and uh, we're continuing to have technical discussions, and we would anticipate uh, later on after the crown demonstrations uh, that that would be, we'll hopefully get some more feedback from them. And that's all I had. I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy to kind of get a little bit more to the details of what our uh, kinder and gentler loading operations look like. Sure. Thank you, Tom. And uh, good morning to everyone. And appreciate your interest in our activities. Um, as you know, during launch attempt number two, we had that QD leak, which is a quick disconnect leak um, on the 8-inch filled drain line at the TSMU interface. The team has really done a fantastic job kind of going through the data, uh, what caused, what they believe kind of what caused and what mitigations we have. We changed out the seals uh, on that QD out at the pad. Um, we've updated procedures and we're now ready to get into our cryo demonstration. Tom mentioned our uh, primary test objectives. So let's maybe kind of start with the big picture. Uh, right now we are tracking no technical concerns to going into Wednesday. Um, so our constraints all look good. Probably the biggest concern that we have is weather, which we are always watching in Florida. As you guys know, it's been a very dynamic uh, couple of weeks for us, um, lightning storms and things like that. But right now, we're looking pretty good for Wednesday. Um, there's about a 15% chance of lightning within five nautical miles. Um, so that actually meets our criteria. So we're going to continue to watch that over the next day or so and, and just make sure that's the case. And it looks even a little bit better earlier in the morning. Um, so just something to really keep an eye on. But right now we are meeting our requirements. And so, uh, you know, of course, those forecasts will get better. When, uh, when you look at what are kind of the major timelines, so we're actually going to have call to stations for this test today at 1500 or 3 p.m. As we go into it, um, at T minus nine hours at about 340 Eastern in the morning on uh, Wednesday, we'll begin the BDA clear of all non-essential personnel. About an hour after that, 
are at T minus 7 hours 50 minutes, uh, we get into air to GN2 changeover. Um, after that, we go into a two and a half hour built in hold. Mm -hmm. We expect the launch director to give us a, cro a go for cryo loading at uh, about 0700 Eastern. The pre press test to be uh, a couple hours or a few hours later, right, or, right just before 1 p.m. Eastern, or at T minus two hours, 18 minutes. And then we expect all things to be completed by about 3 p.m. Uh, if all is going well. Um, we do not intend to go uh, into terminal count, or so it'll conclude prior to T minus 10 minutes. Um, when kind of talking about configuration, Orion will be unpowered, boosters will be unpowered. We do intend to load both the core stage and the ICPS but we will not be doing any FTS testing, COM testing, NAV. So basically really looking primarily at the cryo performance and cryo demonstration. No range will be required during this test. And uh, our number of our test objectives are much simpler there because we're really kind of focusing on that. As Tom talked about kind of the kindler, gentler loading, what we're really doing is we're really trying to minimize both um, pressure spikes and thermal spikes. So our team really thought about how we can go about doing that. Uh, what we are going to be doing is slowly bringing up the pressure on the um, LH2 sphere or the storage tank out at the pad. And so it's going to be a very slow, steady ramp. Uh, we're also controlling the main fuel valve uh, for that fill drain there. And, um, and again, kind of spend some time really thermally conditioning it before we open it all the way. And so the team feels that this helps mitigate some of the risks that we saw, which, you know, um, again, with, with hydrogen in particular, you're talking very, very extreme temperatures, and so really just trying to slowly introduce some of those thermal uh, differences and reduce thermal and pressure shock. Let's see. Um, tomorrow, as we kind of go into this with call to stations this afternoon, we're going to do all our final preps, walk downs, everything like that before we leave the pad, make sure all of our GN2 systems are ready. And um, yeah, I think those are probably the big things that we could talk about and all, all goes well. Uh, we would save the vehicle and then prepare for the launch attempt, but you know, we're really kind of focused on this crowd demonstration right now. I think I was going to turn it over to John to talk about some of the different things we have, uh, you know, been looking at over the last couple of weeks. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. This is John Blevins. Uh, glad to be here and talk about the vehicle again. Uh, first of all, as Jeremy pointed out, there's been a big collaborative effort. We've looked through a lot of different things on the vehicle for the, uh, the incident that we um, realized during the tanking and uh, of the launch attempt too, and, and uh, I will say that, as he mentioned, that we've gone down that fault tree and we've mitigated many different items. I think one of the more significant is the kindler, gentler, uh, the slower slopes, if you will, of pressure and temperature that Jeremy just talked about, and so looking forward to uh, how we load the vehicle that way. I will say that the ground system and the vehicle have been working together very closely to uh, try to accomplish that. Look at our history of data. Uh, this is a new system when it gets to the loading and uh, of, of, uh, of our machine and, and so on the ground side and the flight side. And so working together, we've gone through that history of data to try to get back inside of an envelope that we're more confident and comfortable with, and I think that's going to be uh, a good result. But our witness will be during the cryo demo test on Wednesday, and so we're looking forward to that. Our focus is really on that cryo demo test. Uh, we are looking at other things to make sure that we're ready uh, should we have the ability to stay in this launch period uh, pending a successful crowd demo test and other things that we're working. The vehicle is looking good right now with no constraints for the crowd demo test. And so now I'll turn it over to our Artemis mission manager, Mike Serafin. Hey, good morning, and uh, this is Mike Serafin. Um, <clears throat> I'll just uh, briefly summarize uh, how we got here and what our what our next steps are. So if, if you look back at the uh, last launch attempt, the team encountered a large hydrogen leak at the tail service mast umbilical, which is used to fill and drain the, the uh, Space Launch System rocket's uh, core stage. And uh, as a result of that large uh, hydrogen leak, uh, we scrubbed the launch attempt, and at the post-scrub uh, mission management team meeting, the team brought forward three options. And the first option was to simply demate and remate the tail service mast umbilical 
but we had a low level of confidence that that would work. Uh, the other two options were to uh, remove and replace the uh, the seals and the soft goods, either at the pad or back in the vehicle assembly building. And the uh, recommendation proved to be the right thing uh, in terms of removal and replacement of the of the seal. At the, in particular, the eight inch quick disconnect. Uh, we found a, uh, a witness mark or an indentation on the soft goods associated with foreign object debris. Uh, they, we did not recover a piece of uh, foreign object debris, but there was clearly an indentation or a witness mark in that seal um, that uh, showed us that there was a problem at that at that eight inch uh, quick disconnect seal um, that uh, uh, contributed to the hydrogen leak. So the team has since worked through that and uh, and also proposed uh, to test this new loading operation, as well as to uh, confirm the, uh, the integrity of the seal under cryogenic conditions. And the only place that we can test the, uh, the tail service mast umbilical um, under cryogenic conditions is at the pad. So we are on a path to do that on Wednesday of this week through the cryo demonstration that, that Tom and uh, Jeremy and John outlined Assuming the uh, cryo demonstration meets the objectives that, that were outlined by Tom, uh, we will set up for a launch attempt uh, as early as uh, Tuesday the 27th, and we'll have a launch minus two-day mission management team on Sunday uh, the 25th, and we'll go through uh, the outcome of, the, uh, of any uh, changes that have occurred since the prior attempt and any incremental risk acceptance. Uh, the uh, the attempt on the 27th, uh, right now, it, uh, we've had to uh, assess a busy range schedule as well as a busy schedule of agency activities, and, and that date was driven by a whole host of factors that, it, that include uh, uh, other launches on the range and, and other agency missions uh, that compete for resources. And then the uh, backup attempt, uh, should we need that, uh, we're looking at uh, October the 2nd, Sunday, October the 2nd. So that's kind of how we got here, and that's our path forward. And, and with that, I'll pass it back to Catherine. Now we'll take questions. Uh, again, those on the phone should press star 1 to be entered into the queue at any time, and you can press star 2 to be removed from the queue. Uh, please state your name and your affiliation and to uh, whom you're addressing your question. And, of course, we please ask that you stick to one question uh, so that we can get to as many reporters as possible. Uh, so we'll start with Marcia Dunn from the Associated Press. Uh, yes, hi. Good morning. Um, for the seal within in the indentation, how, how big is the, was the flaw, is the flaw the indentation, um, and what kind of foreign debris may have caused something like that? Thanks. John, do you want to take that one? Yeah, uh, you know, there is a, a physical witness when you look uh, at the seal. I, I don't really want to speculate so much on, on the pod. You know, um, I think if you pick up on a lot of the different conversations we've had, it goes back to what I said earlier, right? There's a fault tree. Uh, I've kind of made it analogous to having one equation with four unknowns or more, and we are coming out with every plausible scenario, and that could be one. And we miti we're mitigating all of those uh, scenarios, which would include the uh, the two mentioned uh, earlier, um, but in, in reality, there is a little bit of witness that we think is consistent with where the seal leaked. But even that is not fully known. Uh, the good news is we're going to have a witness to all these changes that we've made and all of the mitigations that we're pursuing, and it's going to be in very short order on Wednesday during that cryo demo. Thank you. Our next question is from Bill Harwood of CBS News. Hey, thanks, guys. I think this is uh, also for John. Um, you guys have mentioned in past briefings that the, the, the hydrogen concentration limit is 4%. What does that actually mean in terms of the actual threat? And is the goal of this test zero, or is anything below 4% acceptable for flight? Thanks. John, yeah, do you want me to take that one, or you got it? Uh, well, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, that'd be great if you took it. I'll follow yeah, up. So, so it's it's one of our launch commit criteria. It's 4% uh, 
hydrogen in, within kind of that enclosed volume, what we have is we have a series of has gas leak detection sensors uh, that basically we purge the environment around it in helium and then we pull off uh, with a mass spectrometer um, you know, to, to determine if there is hydrogen in, in that environment, and it's calibrated very carefully. So, you know, ideally, we want to keep it less than 4%. Um, the reason where 4% is set is it's kind of the flammability of hydrogen in air. So that's where you start to enter a certain amount of risk of flammability. Um, you know, it's really a, a relatively conservative limit. That being said, that's where we have set it because you want to keep that all controlled and then go into a stop flow. Uh, so it doesn't get worse. Um, we keep that environment inerted with helium as, as well, so uh, you know it doesn't have an oxidizer there um, to to cause a flame. So in, in terms of our goal for this test, you know we really want to keep it beneath that four percent. Anything above zero, we're going to watch closely, understand any correlation, uh, but really the primary goal is is again to meet those LCC limits. And John, do you got anything to add to that? I think you covered it. I think one of the things Bill's asking about, the the danger, if you will, uh, and, and certainly you covered that we've got helium in there uh, to eliminate any of that concern. But, you know, the bottom line is, is if we're leaking, we want to understand that. And so we set a really good number. And that 4% is uh, historic because of that flammability in the air, which we're obviously not doing. But uh, we'd like to make sure that we maintain that 4% on these systems. Thank you. Our next question is from Gina Sinceri of ABC Network News. How optimistic are you that you will get an exemption for your flight termination batteries? Hey, Gina, this is John. Yeah, this is Tom. I can start, and then I'll let, um, I'll let John uh, add to it. Right now, we're still in the process of having technical discussions. Uh, with the range, um, it's been very uh, productive and collaborative, uh, and so we just need to see where those um, discussions take us. And so I don't, and we're being respectful of their processes, so I don't think we're the right ones to answer your question. John, do you have anything else you want to add to that? Or? Yeah, I'll just add that uh, there's been continued dialogue, uh, very good dialogue. Uh, they've got the uh, responsibility of public safety, and so. They've asked for additional information. We provide that additional information. Uh, certainly, you know, they know we're going to do this cryo demo test regardless of, uh, of a waiver extension or not. And so we really haven't been focused other than answering their questions on any kind of deadline to get that news back. And so we'll let them do what they do and uh, see if, uh, if the data we provide them answers the questions they've gotten. And if there's additional data they need, we'll provide that as well. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeff Faust of Space News. Hey, good afternoon. Um, question probably for Mike Serafin. Uh, is the Sunday MMT meeting the, the date where you will decide whether to proceed with the September 27th launch? Would it be possible to make that decision sooner based on what you see out of the cryo test or what you hear from the Eastern Range in terms of the uh, FTS waiver? Yeah, Jeff, the, um, <clears throat> the launch minus two-day mission management team meeting is, is you know, a, a um, launch readiness review and a resync. It's a, it's a decision gate as we, as we reconvene and reactivate the mission management team. Uh, we are, you know, proceeding towards a uh, attempt as early as the 27th. Uh, there's a there's a number of decision gates between now and then. Wednesday, the crowd demo is a key decision gate. Um, any additional uh, findings or, or uh, corrective actions that, that may come out of the crowd demo uh, could occur between Wednesday and, and the launch minus two day and mission management team meeting. But that is, that is a formal decision gate uh, where, where we will, uh, you know, decide on whether we want to proceed with with uh, that particular attempt, so it's it's just a mindful check uh, as we as we uh, proceed towards a particular um, opportunity and and Sunday, you know, if there if there's new information that comes forward, that's that's an opportunity to discuss it. So we may we may make the decision before that. Uh, it's it really kind of depends on on what the outcome of Wednesday is and and what if anything we need to change or learn between now and then. 
this is Tom. I agree with Mike. We're just taking this a step at a time. Right now, honestly, our focus is on the crowd demonstration coming up Wednesday, and we really like to get through that. We like to see how the vehicle performs, so these new loading operations are, are successful. We have plenty of time after that to see what kind of feedback we get and take whatever steps we need to take uh, after that point. But I think for us, we really want to get through the crowd load demo uh, coming up Wednesday. That's just two days away. <laughs> so if you can hang tight, let's, we'll go through that and we'll, we'll see how that turns out and we'll have a, a discussion after that. We'll let you know how things are doing. Thank you. Our next question is from Micah Maidenberg of Wall Street Journal. Hi there. Thanks for doing this. I think this might be for Mike Serafin. Um, Mike, could you, or someone else, could you explain which contractor or if NASA is responsible to scan for FOD? And deal with it and did that party sort of miss this uh thought that, that you've been talking about today thanks hey mike do you mike, want me uh, to take that one yeah you can take it uh, jeremy I'll, I'll tag something on the tail end go ahead okay so as part of our procedures we uh we clean both the entirety of the plate uh we clean the seal and and the contractor is um it's the jacobs talks contract uh, right now it, you know, we have closeout photos uh, not showing any FOD. I think kind of how Mr. Blevin or Dr. Blevins kind of said it right, which is of the potential causes, FOD is one of them, um, you know, as well as kind of the thermal and pressure shock. What we're doing is we're trying to mitigate each one of those branches of the fault tree. And so in, in this case, for example, um, we did full cleaning. We tended the area uh, before we made the plates. And, um, and we really made sure everything looked good and there was no FOD present. So uh, that's probably kind of the, the takeaway there. But we don't, again, we didn't capture any FOD when we demade it, and we had scuppers beneath it to look for that. Um, but it's just one of the branches of the fault tree. So I'm sorry, Mike, you got anything else? Yeah, and Micah, the only thing I would add is we have the foreign object debris or FOD control programs across the entire agency, across all the production and, uh, and assembly and integration and test facilities, uh, regardless of, of whether they are associated with the rocket, the spacecraft, or the ground system. So um, there, there is a robust program out there um, that, that goes from the manufacturing sites all the way to the launch site. Um, so I just wanted to kind of note that as well. Yeah, this is Tom. I'm going to have John talk a little. I don't want to overly focus on that part of this discussion today because we're still learning. It's an indication that we saw. So I don't want to make it sound like it's a straightforward thing at this point. Uh, and it's probably a multivariant thing. There's probably some other stuff that uh, contributed. Remember, we got through the first loading. Okay. So um, I don't know, John, you have a better way to describe it. We saw an indentation that could have been caused by and multiple actual things. <laughs> I wish it was that clear cut. But John, help us out a little bit because I think it's a little more complicated than that. Yeah, you know, for me, um, you know, you do see an indentation in the seal, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, there's just so many different things that could have uh, created that indentation, and, and we believe that indentation is consistent with the leak, but we don't fully know that either. But but we've mitigated everything that we believe could be. And so the the discussion of FOD has come up, uh, but as Jeremy said, there's closeout photos uh, that show that it, it is likely not part of this particular case. But either way, each one of our fault tree lines, and there are many, uh, a lot of which have to do with how we are loading the vehicle, and that, that lends itself to the, uh, the kinder, gentler um, process that we discussed, the lower rates of change of pressure and temperature. Um, and so um, ultimately we've mitigated everything that we can think of, uh, and we will know in and, and, uh, 36 hours or so or 48 hours uh, how effective those mitigations were. And so, um, so I, I certainly, I actually do not hang my hat on any particular cause on the fault tree. I think the fault tree probably includes an actual cause, and I think the cause is probably not knowable in any particular discrete way because I, I just don't have the information to make those conclusions. And so these are all plausible scenarios that are consistent with leakage, and we are going down each path and eliminating those. Thank you. Our next question is from Kristen Fisher of CNN. During a previous meeting, Jim Free had said that you guys had made some 
manual procedure changes between the first and second launch attempt when it comes to the, the pressurization of the hydrogen lines. So I, I'm curious, have those procedure changes been automated? Are they still manual? And if they are still manual, have those operators been given uh, more time to practice than they were before that, that second launch attempt? Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. This is Jeremy Parsons, by the way. Um, so, you know, looking at the procedures, um, there was a number of manual uh, type um, steps in uh, coming out of launch attempt number one and launch attempt number two as we, as we did what we thought was in uh, the direction of goodness. Um, what we did this time around, we had a little bit more time, um, so we've largely automated all of the procedures. So we're down to only four to five manual commands throughout the entire procedure. Um, in terms of training, we tested for uh, three test runs, validated all of the software. We then loaded that software, and the, and the team has uh, been able to do two more sims since then. So um, really gotten quite a bit of training in uh, over a number of days. We've also built in pauses where the sequencer or that automated software piece will stop and require console operator input. And, um, and so, you know, we've also put in prerequisite logic to help avoid any commands being able to be sent uh, unless, you know, the conditions are right and they're in line with the steps. So um, team has really kind of stepped back, look at everything that occurred over those last two attempts, and then uh, spent a lot of time on the software, which was, which was really good. Yeah, this is something. Well, yeah, I mean, Jerry, this kinder, gentler loading operations is going to be a big help. You know, it's, it's we're taking these transitions at a slower rate. The pressure and temperature changes will be more gradual, and so that's robustness across the board, right? You can, regardless of what, what causes a situation to occur, everything else that Jeremy described is all every every path that we can think of in terms of uh, being able to do these operations as smoothly and as as effectively as possible. So I'm really proud of the team because I think they've really taken a look at everything, and not just to focus on software, but just everything that we can do to make this a really a successful operation. And the good thing about something like that is that we'll benefit from that. From now on. That's what John talks about, learning the machine. And it's one of the really kind of tremendous things that we've learned and I'm really excited to go do this on Wednesday is to see how this new approach, uh, which is really multivariate, Things that we're doing in different areas across the board to really make this uh, as effective an uh, operation as we can come up with. And I, I just think that KFC Temp's done a pretty good job at that. John, do you have any other thoughts? Because I really think there's some physics here that we're really uh, addressing as well. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. I think you guys covered it well. Thank you. Our next question is from Stephen Clark of Space Flight Now. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Just wanted to follow up on an earlier question about the size of this indentation you found. I know you mentioned that maybe not the only potential cause with multiple variables, but uh, just curious about the size of this indentation in this seal. And um, also, uh, during the September 3rd launch attempt, what was the level of uh, hydrogen concentration that was reached? Uh, the limit's 4%. What was the number uh, percentage? during that large leak on the third. Thanks. Um, let's see. Yeah, as far as, uh, Stephen, this is Mike Serap, and as far as the size of the indentation, it was uh, just under 0 .01 inches. Um, now, that doesn't sound like a lot, but again, we're dealing with hydrogen, the smallest particle on the atomic chart. Um, so, you know, an indentation of that size that does provide an opportunity for a, a pressurized gas to leak through that. Um, and then in terms of the concentrations that we saw on uh, our attempt on the third, as I recall, it was, it was somewhere between two and three times the accepted limit. And, and it was repeatable with multiple um, attempts to uh, work through the leak or, or heal or seal the leak. Um, um, I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but it's, as I recall, yeah. it was two to two so, to three times. So, I don't know, Jeremy or John, if you, if you have the numbers or anything. Yeah. Mike, so, so what we saw with the, the system <laughs> is it, it shot up to about 8% uh, as we got into kind of a, a thermally stable sort of condition out at, at, at the low hydrogen temperatures. Um, 
and, and basically that was repeatable. Every time, you know, from that point on, whenever we put, you know, greater than a, a, a very low amount of pressure, you know, a um, couple of PSI, you would see that leak spike up. Uh, but, yeah, so it was two, uh, two times the, the LCC limit, and there are indications that it would go much higher than that if we allowed it to. Um, I'll tell you why we use the word multivariant. John will help me out with this. We had a successful loading operation to launch Tech One. In fact, it wasn't for the LCC, which we now realize was a bad LCC. We would have continued with the count and we made the launch of the vehicle. And so this didn't show up on launch attempt one. We go into launch attempt two, same seal, same everything, and now we see something and we see an indication. So there's certainly more than one aspect to this condition that we don't really uh, fully understand. We know, so what we've done is we've looked at every path possible that could be related to it and making sure that we've done everything we can to, to have a, a good um, condition with the seals, a good loading operations, got the physics in, uh, dialed in a little bit more. And so that's really a multivariant approach to something that I don't know if we'll ever know conclusively exactly uh, how that happened, how we had successful loading operations in the first attempt, and then we saw this fairly early on and very distinct. And so so that's not intuitive, at least to me. Uh, John, do you have any thoughts on that? I, I just I, I wish I could give you the specific answer. That's a very good question, but I don't know if we have the exact answer. Stephen, you know, the only thing I'll add to, to what the other three uh, have added, this is John Levins, is that, you know, due to machine learning, if you will, we've changed our process every time. You know, we, we had early wet dresses where we didn't get to this phase and we didn't learn that part of the machine. and on this one, we made some changes that weren't intended to be there for launch day, as Tom said, to verify one of the things we didn't accomplish in wet dress or So those changes, um, you know, very well may have played in. We do expect that, you know, within the age life of these seals and all, that once we get to an operational status, that we'll be able to map out the machine's corners, if you will, and understand these signatures. Uh, we did a lot of testing, the ground system guys did here. Uh, prior to that, and, and so we've gone back and looked at all that data, and we were outside of the, those ramp rates, right? That's what we're fixing is those temperature and pressure ramp rates, uh, and so we were outside of those. And so that's one of the things that I, I think we ought to focus on. But again, in 48 hours, I'm going to have a pretty good witness to whether these processes have fixed it or if I need to think of other things, uh, and the whole team needs to regroup on that. But no, uh, you guys have it uh, generally right. I, well, I will say I do think that the system will be consistent once we map out, if you will, the corners of our operational box, and we will do that. Thank you. Our next question is from Alicia Sowers from Mashable. Hi. Thanks for taking my question. Um, initially, we were talking about a 42-day mission. Um, let's just say hypothetically Artemis launches on the 27th. How would that affect the length of the flight and the return date? And if you could just remind me, at what point does the mission shift to that shortened duration option? Thanks. Hi, Alicia. This is Mike Serafin. So uh, a launch on the 27th would result in a 39-day mission uh, splashing down on the 5th. The, uh, the way that um, our current launch period is set up, we have uh, shorter duration missions towards the front of the launch period and then longer duration missions towards the back of the, of the launch period. So the 27th and later are all what we call long class missions in the 38, 39, 40 day range. So um, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Our next question is from Eric Berger of Ars Technica. Hi. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, two questions uh, for Mike, I think. First of all, there's a 70-minute launch window on the 27th. Is that at all a concern, you know, given that you've had a couple hours before and, and there may be some challenges, obviously, as you get down closer to the terminal count. Um, and another one is about the loss of vehicle risk. I, I guess it was a few weeks ago you mentioned um, a mission risk of about 1 in 125. And, I, and I'm just wondering if you could talk about how your team arrived at that figure. You know, I'm, I'm obviously not an engineer, but I've spoken to a lot of them about this, and it just seems like that estimate's pretty optimistic for a new rocket and a spacecraft on its second flight. Thanks. Yeah, Eric, um 
good questions. The 70 minute window, uh, you know, any, any launch window is, is a good window, a good opportunity to, uh, to set up for, um, obviously longer launch windows give you more flexibility. If you, um, have a, a weather or technical or issue with the range, uh, where we, where we, uh, have a, a range safety or public, uh, issue with the public, um, we do, um, Longer windows just provide us with more flexibility. So um, there's really no concern with a 70 minute window versus a full 120 minute window. Um, we just have reduced flexibility to work through problems uh, regardless of the nature. It could, it could just be, you know, a thunderstorm rolling through. Uh, in terms of the, the risk number, the one in 125, again, again that is from uh, what we call a probabilistic risk assessment. There's a whole host of factors that go into it, including um, system um, fault tolerance and, and redundancy. How many, how many uh, propulsive, uh, you know, engines do you have to maneuver in space? We have a primary engine and we have auxiliary engines that we can download to. Um, it, how how um, prolific is the micrometeoroid and orbital debris environment based on the latest models and and uh, that factors into it. Uh, there's a whole host of other factors, uh, including, um, you know, the thermal protection system, the parachute system, uh, test data that we've got gotten back from from the test programs. We had a very robust parachute test program out at the uh, Yuma Proving Grounds in Arizona that that uh, you know enabled us to get this far. Um, we've done a whole host of tests with the rocket and the spacecraft. So all that information is fed into this probabilistic risk assessment. It's compared against um, just known um, design features or design limitations within the vehicle. And then uh, there's also just some um, what I'll call historic or, or corporate knowledge that's, that's fed in across all the programs in terms of where some of the uh, the most likely uh, causes of, of loss of vehicle um, could could stem from. Um, so there's a myriad of factors that go into the probabilistic risk assessment, and, and based on the uh, the assessment that our own experts have pulled together, um, that was that was the number that they came back with. I don't know, Tom, if you have anything to add. I used to do this for a living. <laughs> yeah, and I, Mike did a great job, right? It's a tool that we use. It's one of many tools that we have in the system to try to fly the vehicle as safely as possible. Uh, it helps us understand we're relatively using similar criteria where we stand with the vehicle, but we know it's not absolutely, uh, you know, an absolute tool. And also some of the analysis is assuming a more mature system. So, you know, I think it's a really good thing for us to evaluate and look at. Um, and uh, we do have a lot of history with the Heritage Hardware in particular with these vehicles, particularly the propulsion systems, which typically drive a lot of the risk for the vehicle. Um, but we also recognize it's just a, a piece of information. It's a tool that we use, and, and we use it to guide us in, in learning how we can improve the vehicle more than anything else. Yeah. And Tom, you made, a, you made a very important point there. It is a relative risk um, analysis or, or a tool that enables us to understand what are the primary drivers. So again, I'll, I'll pick on micrometeoroid and orbital debris. That is one of our top risk drivers. It is an order of magnitude greater than our command and data handling system. But, you know, the flight computers and, and command and data handling systems on spacecraft now are very robust. They're very mature. We've tested the heck out of these systems. So in terms of relative risk, we know that orbital debris is way at the top of the list in terms of risk driver, and we know command and data handling is is towards the bottom or the tail of the of the risk profile. So that's where these tools are very useful. They're, they're again, they're not absolute numbers, um, but it, it provides some sense of what is driving the risk and is it on par with, with something that you would consider to be an acceptable level of risk uh, headed into a, a, a mission and a launch as opposed to something that Re really requires additional mitigation. Yeah, I think it's kind of cool. You know, the orbital debris is such a big influence that we shape our mission trajectories to try to minimize that risk. So we actively do things in the mission design. Mission managers help us out doing this stuff. 
and we, we try to minimize the risk of the vehicle. So that's the cool thing about the tool is you can actually dial some things around a little bit and lower your risk, and that's, that's how we use the tool. Thank you. Our next question is from Lauren Gresh of Bloomberg. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I'm just curious, are there any scenarios in which you might proceed with the launch attempt if you experience any separate leaks during the tanking test, perhaps in a different area than the QD, or does this test need to go more or less perfectly before you'll make the decision to proceed with the attempt? Thank you. Yeah, at this time, let me start with that, and then I'll let some other folks jump in and help me out a little bit. You know, we call it a cryogenic demonstration for a very uh, specific reason. Uh, we're trying to demonstrate some physics, actually, associated with the vehicle and our lowering the stress of the vehicle. Because we have this multivariant thing that we're trying to address, we felt that, that was an incredibly important variant for us to smooth out. Now, other things can happen. We could have bad weather. Some the fan could go down completely unrelated to the vehicle. We've seen that in the past, and, uh, you know, we'll hopefully we won't experience that. Uh, so we're, we're just going to take it a step at a time. I'd really like to just get through the test. The criteria we have is very straightforward. It's easy to track and monitor to see if we met the criteria. We don't leak or we don't leak. Um, and so that's really the focus, is, is truly to look at the physics of the loading operation, make it a kinder, gentler thing. We know we have a multivariate thing that we want to address from multiple perspectives, and we believe this gives us the best opportunity to do that. And we're not just setting ourselves up for the launch attempt on the 27th, but we're fortunate we're setting ourselves up for the future of this vehicle. And so we're, that's why we're really taking the time and the effort to really make sure we understand the vehicle and we're really setting it up uh, for robustness in the future, so we have a much better um, position in future uh, launch attempts. Uh, John, do you have anything you want to add to that? And I'll ask Jeremy too, because each one of us has some specific things that we're trying to accomplish here on Wednesday. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would say the crowd demo has to have some 100% mark or something. It's, it's really about understanding the machine and mapping out those boundaries uh, for me and informing our decision makers uh, what a risk moving forward would be. I, I certainly think that we will be successful and and we'll see in a couple of days if we are. And uh, if there's any residual risk that remains, I'm sure we'll talk as an agency about that and we'll we'll try to quantify it uh, about moving forward. And Jeremy, I know you guys are a big part of this too. Do you have any additional thoughts here? Uh, let's see, I, I think John said it real well, right? Which is um, anything that it, is off nominal, we will capture, understand, understand if there's any mitigation measures, and we'll present that to the MMT uh, for risk acceptance or, or not at that point. And so our team's gathering a lot of data, a lot of good training as we perfect some of these procedures, and, and um, you know, we're really focused on that right now. Yeah, I think it's going to be a great demonstration, so we're really looking forward to it. Thank you. Our next question is from Tarek Malik of Space.com. Hello. Yes, thank you. Um, I have, a, a, I guess, hopefully a quick one for, for John and one for uh, for um, Mike. So, John, how much extra time does a kindly central loading process mean in an already tight fueling timeline uh, for Artemis 1? Um, and and for, for Mike, uh, October 2nd was noted as an under-review backup date. Uh, what's the status on that? Is it viable at this point in time, or is it September 27th or bust for this window? Thank you. Hey, Terry, this is John. Jeremy, 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 Jeremy,
And um, that said, we, we are we are internally marching ahead uh, because if if uh, some of these uh, activities require a longer lead time than we've got available, so it, it's it's not to decide uh, what what the range is or isn't going to say. This is really just so that we, as our as our own NASA team and the Artemis team, are ready uh, when when a decision is rolled out because we require advanced uh, uh, planning and advanced effort out there. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Our next question is from Lucy Auburge of AFP. Hi. Thanks for doing this. I just have a quick question about the, the waiver that you're asking for. Um, you keep referring to the ranch, but I'm sorry, I still, I'm still not quite sure I understand who you are having discussion with. Is this, is this the Air Force? Who, who are you negotiating with exactly, if you could just clarify that? Thank you. Well, John, I, I, you know, first of all, Lucy, um, to be informative, you know, we're providing detailed technical information about the specific systems and processes and procedures that we have, the hardware that we're flying. It's a very, very detailed conversation that we're having. We started at our appropriate technical level, so Don, in fact, I think that we had conversations today. It's a lot of information, and they have a very a process that we're uh, very um, – focused, uh, productive, collaborative set of discussions that we're going through. It's a lot of information. I think there's an awful lot of information involved with these systems and how they were manufactured and tested and qualified and what the conditions have been that we've been monitoring. And it's very important for us to share that information and make sure they have an opportunity to review that information. That's the process that we're going through right now um, at the um, at the Space Force level. And usually we try to do this at the, the detailed technical level. They, they have an individual who's responsible for these type of things within their organization, within the Space Force. And uh, we're just trying to provide as much detailed information. They've asked really good questions, by the way. I've, I've been very impressed with their folks. They're very confident. They're capable people. They ask really, really good questions. We've had to go back and get more information. So it's really kind of us uh, trying to provide the best possible important decision. It just takes a little bit of time. It's a, it's a lot of information. Uh, John, did you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, Lucy, just specifically, it's the Space Force. Uh, so Tom got that, and their mission is to protect the public safety, and so they're responsible for all the vehicles that launch, not just ours, and, uh, uh, and they'll make a decision whether uh, we meet the requirements for public safety or not, and we'll adhere to that uh, decision. Our next question is from Marcia Smith of SpacePolicyOnline.com. Uh, thanks so much. Just uh, two quick questions about time. How much time would it take for you to roll back and replace the FTS and then get back on the pad ready to launch? And separately, although I think Hurricane Fiona is probably going to go out to sea, last I heard, but uh, would you remind us how much time it takes you to get it back the safety in the VAB and then back up to the pad if it's a hurricane as opposed to something like replacing the FTS? Yeah, I, I think Jeremy could do the hurricane VAB stuff, um, and, and that is a unique situation. We would do a uh, very specific set of operations. In terms of the rest, I think we're just going to wait until we get through the crowd demo, and then we'll figure out where we're at. I really, that's what we're focused in on right now. But Jeremy, for the hurricane, uh, what's what, what timeline is Charlie carrying at this point? Yeah, so, so again, we're watching all storms very closely. Our team receives uh, weather briefings first thing every morning. Uh, basically, in the event of a hurricane, we would need to make a decision about three days out uh, to roll back to the vehicle assembly building. And so, you know, again, that's why we're keeping an eye on everything uh, at this point. But, um, you know, it, it differs depending on how far into the pad flow we are. Uh, you know, if we had just rolled out, it would be a different timeline than kind of where we are now. Where we're at today, it would take three days. Thank you. Our next question is from Michael Greshko of National Geographic. Hi, thank you all for doing this. Um, to follow up on some of the procedures discussion earlier, um, as you all have worked through the fault tree, do you have any further clarity on how much that brief 60 PSI over pressurization 
could have contributed to the leak? John, I guess you could start with that one, and then Jeremy, but I had some thoughts on that at the end. Yeah, uh, Michael, this will be a little bit unsatisfying if you were listening earlier because I'm going to give you that same answer. We've gone through the fault tree. We've identified every possible action or um, incident that could cause us to experience that leak. I will say that one of the things that really stands out, just to say it again, is, is we did some testing at the Launch Environments Test Facility, and we mapped out uh, this, uh, this seal, you know, so we didn't show up unknowing at the uh, – at the pad, but the thermal mass and, and the way we change pressures once you put the new system together did have these ramp rates of pressure and temperature that are just vastly different uh, than what we tested in our test facility. And so we're going back to replicate something that we do know and something we've been successful at and something we called the seal to. And so, you know, I don't really want to hang my hat or dismiss or um, uh, any of those options. Uh, like I said, I've got one equation, four or five unknowns. and. I can come up with several plausible scenarios, and uh, and, and that may not even be um, as plausible as, as many of them, particularly the ones where we're operating outside of those ramp rates where we did before. So it's a machine. It's going to operate like we tell it to operate within its life expectancy, and that's what we're trying to return to, and we'll map that out and do that. Yeah, and I don't know, Jeremy, if you have any additional thoughts. Um, maybe just a, a little bit of perspective so the you know the 60 psi we have what's uh, called kind of a an envelope limit that's normally provided during operations where we try and keep it within 45 psi as that was exceeded our reactive control logic kicked in um, and and it was down it was about a four second spike um, so we kind of have that envelope limit which is you know what we intend to operate at um, the design was qualified to significantly higher about 120 psi um, and, and again, you didn't see the leak right away, right? You didn't see the leak until you started getting to those thermal uh, environments at the fully kind of cold hydrogen temperature. That being said, kind of like what John's saying, right? We've created a fault tree. Um, we're mitigating this potential cause as well as, um, you know, QD compression as well as FOD, things like that, and, and just really trying to make sure that any potential instances, we're working through that fault tree and, and mitigating either by procedures, um, you know, logic controls, and, and things along those lines. So uh, trying to knock everything out that we can. Yeah, yeah, the, and this is Tom. Yeah, Mike and I have an unfair advantage. We actually have a, one of the eight-inch seals up here at headquarters. We're um, holding it and, and squeezing it and all these things that you can do to the seal. And, you know, it's, 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 it's made out of Teflon. It's got a little spring behind that backboard spring. So it's a kind of a complicated thing when you talk about a pressure, temperature, trans rapid spike coming through the system as you go through your initial loading operations. And we were at a higher pressure, which is I'm really excited to get the, 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 the slower pressure sphere going for the initial loading operations. And when you're seeding up the system, you're chilling it down, the system's a little bit warm. So that hydrogen is creating its own pressure. It's not just the head pressure in the sphere, but it's actually kind of uh, warming up a little bit as you transition into the early processes. That's a very kind of complicated thing to understand. Then there's this independent that we saw, and then there's this, this momentary command, which may or may not have had any real effect at all. So it's just like, I know it's hard if you haven't seen the fall tree, you haven't sat through all these meetings that we sit through. A lot of, lot of different things going on, and it's really wouldn't be, you know, we could come to you and say, hey, we know exactly it was this if we could, but we, we, we just don't know. And so we're trying to be uh, representative of the fact that it's probably a multivariate thing that just was not as robust a process as we would have liked, and it was something that pushed it over the edge and started to leak. Uh, I think our best way of dealing with that is we've looked at every every aspect, everything I just talked about, and then we're going in with some physics, real physics, about lowering the thermal uh, and pressure um, transients uh, that occur, particularly during the early loading operations. And I think that would be a really a, positive step in a really good direction. It took a lot of time to actually sort through that, make sure we would have sufficient pressure for the loading operations, but recognizing that we didn't need the higher pressure until we got into the fast fill, which was later on in our fill. So that, that just took analysis and the testing. And, you know, really, I think that this gives us the best possible opportunity with all those robustness features that we've talked about 
and we get to find out here on Wednesday. <laughs> so it, it's gonna we're gonna learn pretty quickly. And so hang tight. I think you're all having really good conversations, uh, but I think we're just gonna be a lot smarter uh, Wednesday afternoon about three o'clock p.m. So that's where I think we can really give you a much better answer. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, we'll take David Denault from About Space today. David Denault, About Space Today, and my question for Mike or John, if we can say that the cryo test meets all of your criteria and uh, you go into your meeting on the 25th, what is the discussion then with rain safety? Is there, I mean, if you're looking at the 27th as a launch date, it kind of surpasses that 20 to 25 days for uh, their, their safety requirements. So is there a risk reward factor in launching on the 27th if they give approval? John, you want to take a crack at that or do you want me to? Yeah, you know, there's, um, David, um, let, me, let me just say, you know, they're fully aware of what we're doing. Uh, and, you know, the tests that we're doing, we would do regardless of what their decision is. Uh, and we'll do regardless of, of the decision that we're working very closely with them. We want to ensure public safety as well, by the way. So we, we want them to do this analysis and we want to abide by uh, their, their rules. Um, are there advantages to launching sooner? Well, we think so. I, I, I told you in earlier press conferences that we track as a vehicle and Jeremy tracks on the ground side the life limiting items and we'll be changing some of those if we go back because we'll exceed this launch period and we'll need to do that. So. Uh, I, I think there is value in, in launching sooner, uh, but the vehicle is robust, and whether it launches this time or in another launch period, uh, we're just going to effectively go out and, and do our jobs and, uh, and try to make sure we provide the best flight uh, for this system we can. Uh, and so I, I really don't want to get into any big trades there on that, David, because I just don't think they're uh, terribly valuable in the public domain. I think uh, NASA and others will be looking at the best time to launch, and that's ultimately what we're going to do at the end of the day is, is uh, go when the machine is ready, and it's the right time when all of our partners say it's the right time. Yeah, John, you said, uh, this is Mike, I, you said uh, almost exactly what I was thinking, which is we're going to go when, when we're ready. And um, the public safety uh, aspect of this is, is not our risk to weigh. It is, it is the, uh, the Space Forces and the ranges um, uh, to see. Um, but in terms of the reward of flying this flight, we have said from the outset that this is the first in an increasingly complex series of missions, and it is a purposeful, purposeful stress test of the rocket, of the spacecraft, prior to flying crew on the next mission. So, you know, the reward is getting the uh, validation of our new rocket, of our new spacecraft, in the actual flight environment. And, and when we do that is... It, it depends on a whole host of factors, and this, this uh, is just one of those factors, and, and we do not control the risk acceptance of, of the flight termination system. So that's, that's the only thing I would add. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. That is all the time that we have. Um, if you were not able to ask your question, please reach out to myself or one of our public affairs officers. You can listen to a replay of this teleconference online later this afternoon by visiting the Media Resources tab at nasa.gov slash Artemis-1. And you can also watch a live stream of the Rocket on the Pad at the KSC Newsroom YouTube channel. And you can follow along and learn more about the mission at nasa.gov slash specials slash Artemis-1. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us, and have a good day. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.